Every year in sport and general aviation, loss of control events are the single most significant contributor to serious and fatal aircraft accidents. Recognising the onset early and avoiding it in the first place. By the time I'd got it, uh, the aircraft had become airborne in the three-point attitude. I probably didn't even have time to think, oh shit. The plane went into about a 360 degree stall spin and impacted the ground. It's a clear stall spin, a high nose attitude and then a stall. As we start to lose visual reference to the natural horizon, we start to lose our situational awareness as to what the aircraft is doing. In this three-part series, we explore the critical phases of flight where loss of control occur. We look at the primary causes, we look at contributing factors, and we talk to real pilots, subject matter experts, and we delve into the situations and how to avoid these types of accidents. We've used too much rudder to, to keep the aircraft in balance on a full power climb, for example. And now the aeroplane is very slutty. Now I've gone over. Left, left rudder and departure. And we've got your visual again. We'll catch the right turn just to track away from the houses, mate. If we can save just one life, it will be worth making this series. One, two, three. We've just lost over 10 knots. If we're only 200 feet, look what we lost. Yeah, we're in the ground already. That's right. We hope that this series will help create a safer flight environment for our pilots. The loss of control can be related to two separate issues. You can have uh, loss of control due to external factors, wind shear, etc. Or you can have loss of control due to simple misloading or the pilot mishandling of the controls themselves. But when it comes to the normal general aviation application, you uh, want to look at the idea of avoiding a situation which is likely to produce that outcome and uh, recognising the onset early and avoiding it in the first place. Even experienced pilots can be caught out by a loss of control. At the time of the accident, I would have been flying for 25 years. Probably had about 200 hours or more flying experience on that particular aircraft. I've never had any issues with it. Between realising we had an issue and the wing Im impacting the ground, I probably didn't even have time to think, oh shit, it, it really did happen that quickly. So I completed all of the pre-takeoff checks on the run, including a controls full and free, entered the runway and from there just started a normal takeoff sequence. I said to the pilot in the front, handing over. She said, taking over. The throttle was advanced. Uh, once it was at full power, within a couple of a seconds, I expect the stick to come forward. The stick was not being moved forward. So I questioned it. I didn't even get to finish the question. I said, you know, what are you doing? And then she just cut me off and said, it won't move. And so I immediately grabbed the stick, which was hard back, and I could not move it at all. There was not even any play, which was the bit that concerned me the most. And by the time I'd got it and tried to force, force it back forward, uh, the aircraft had become airborne in the three-point attitude and it started to lift the left wing, possibly because the pilot was still holding right rudder in to keep it straight, which is the correct thing to do. And because of that, it impacted on its right-hand wingtip. As soon as the wingtip impacted, the stick became completely free. I felt it, my hand just move straight through forward and forward and to the left and then almost immediately after that it hit on the undercarriage, the undercarriage folded and the aircraft ended up on its belly in one piece apart from the damaged tip and the folded up undercarriage. Just shows that uh, how completely unaware we were caught out. Uh, the end result though is really still a good example of what we've been saying that the aeroplane became airborne when it was not, not intended to allow that to happen. And uh, even ground effect can't help if, you, if you're stuck in a tail low attitude like that. So it, it attempted to get airborne, but um, immediately couldn't fly, so it dropped a wing. But yeah, that's what a shame to see such a, a nice little aeroplane in a, such a mess. Jeremy, as you've said before, that in the takeoff phase of flight, there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. And pilots don't always see what's going on when, when we take off. Got a, um, slipstream effect, we've got precession, P-forces, and a gyroscopic effect. 
as we start to lose visual reference to the natural horizon, we start to lose our situational awareness as to what the aircraft is doing. Okay, so when the nose is above the horizon, it is very, very easy to not be able to see the aircraft yawing, which trans will translate into rolling and put us possibly in a situation we don't want to be in. Yaw can be very subtle and very difficult to see, whereas uh, seeing the aircraft uh, banked or seeing it rolling is much, much easier to see. So pilots naturally will control the roll, where the actual problem is the aircraft is yawing. And of course, all this is happening at high angle of attack, low airspeed and limited control. Lack of controllability. Yeah. And we're, we're very quickly setting ourselves up into a loss of control in flight situation. Absolutely. Ensuring that the aircraft is configured properly for takeoff is vital. However, there is something the pilot should have already considered before they start the engine. You do a pre-flight on your aeroplane, you walk around and look at it. You can't see where the centre of gravity is. It'd be lovely if you had a red line on the fuselage and you could go, oh, oh my centre of gravity is too far back. The big danger with um, centre of gravity problem is the fact that uh, you would get in the aeroplane and do your normal pre-start checks and to you it would feel perfectly normal. You couldn't fault it. You taxi out to the holding point, you do your run-ups, whatever radio calls are required, you'd have no idea there was anything wrong because on the ground the aeroplane's sitting on its undercarriage. But once it becomes suspended under those two imaginary forces of lift and weight, uh, the little arrows that instructors like to draw all over the board once it becomes airborne, it's then that you, you realise the problem exists. At the Caboolture Airport, Neil Schaefer talks about important considerations in the takeoff phase. The well, important point to note as you lift that pressure off the nose wheel, the tendency to the P force will be to your left. Correct airspeed, positive correct attitude, positive rate of climb, runway centre line. The takeoff is a very low energy state for the aircraft, okay? We are in a part of the flight envelope where we don't have that much ability to manoeuvre, okay? So as a pilot, we need to understand what our particular aircraft is going to do on takeoff, what it looks like, and how we actually can control that. So because of the fact we have a propeller on the front of our aircraft, as you mentioned, we have P-factor, we have slipstream effect, we have a gyroscopic effect as we pitch the nose up on takeoff. All of these effects are going to cause the aircraft to you're in one direction or the other, okay? It does depend on the design of your aircraft and the manu engine manufacturer. Roll your... Send downwind, Fox right off there, okay? Break, yep. That yaw for us can sometimes be difficult for us to, to uh, see, especially if the nose is above the horizon. So the aircraft will actually yaw and then roll in the same direction that it is yawing. Okay? Now the consideration for you on takeoff is that because we are at a high angle of attack, okay, the ailerons are not going to be as effective as they normally are. Okay? And so we run the risk of actually getting ourselves into a loss of control in flight through trying to control this yawing tendency by using ailerons. Okay? At the end of the day, your feet are the only things that are actually going to, going to fix this situation and the balance ball is going to tell you whether you're doing the right thing or not. I guess it comes down to how well the pilot is prepared. So when a pilot goes, uh, goes out for a flight, the takeoff is the first thing that happens and it's not until they've actually started the takeoff roll that they may not actually realise that they've actually prepared themselves properly for the flight that they're about to undertake. So proper preparation in the takeoff phase is really important. The second thing is as well that the takeoff involves a lot of changing energy. So you're going basically from a standstill into a flying state very, very quickly. And if the energy of the aircraft is not managed appropriately, if the aircraft is out of balance, if it's overweight, that the, uh, the weight and balance hasn't been done correctly, all those things can come back to bite the pilot very, very quickly at low altitude with very little time to respond. It's really a matter of uh, preserving the, the energy source that's giving you control in the first place, and that's airspeed. So the aeroplane has to become, uh, uh, we have to avoid the temptation at times to get the aeroplane airborne too early and trying to fly it in ground effect. As I've often said to people in commercial aerodynamic classes, you know, the ability to get airborne is there uh, if you want to push it hard you can actually force the aeroplane to get airborne and ground effect and then make an attempt to climb out. 
uh, with insufficient air speed to maintain a, a stable climb. And of course that's going to lead to loss of control uh, eventually uh, still. One of the problems in that area I've always found is if I get airborne, if I do it in an aerodrome like here at Redcliffe, for example, we, can, we pretend that the strip is short. So you don't introduce the psychological aspect of, of uh, I really have to do it today. So the student can be led to believe that it's pretty simple and basic and just follow a couple of rules. The day he gets out to a strip that actually is short, and I'm talking about, I'm talking about still legal as far as the P-chart goes, but the limit of the P-chart. Very few people have that experience well, during their training. When they're faced with that situation, and I really do have to clear the gum trees at the end of the strip, there's a very strong temptation sometimes to, uh, to try to force the aeroplane to the air early, which is the worst thing you can do. That's it, low, 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 low. Right, that's it, like this, in ground yep. effect. Yep, right, like this. There's 60, 70 knots, yep. then you go. The problem with the loss of control is that the stall, the unusual attitude, occurs when the pilot is not expecting it. You're going to experience, or the pilot will experience, what they call startle and surprise. So this startle and surprise is a breakdown of, uh, of the cognitive ability of the pilot, or causes a cognitive breakdown within the pilot to think clearly. And it basically it makes them forget their, their basic training. One, two, three. We've just lost over 10 knots. I've now lowered the nose. We've only just gone back. Look at our sink right now. Yeah, that's right, 1,000 feet a minute right there. Pilots often don't do what they've been trained to do, partly because of startle and surprise, but also when they are taught to fly, they, well, they're taught to fly an attitude, but they don't always correlate an attitude to an angle of attack. So particularly like when we're in the climbing phase of flight on takeoff, for example, if we have something like an engine failure, we may lower the nose, but we haven't actually fixed the angle of attack problem. So it's actually important that we assertively move the controls forward, pitch the aircraft to a safe attitude where we completely avoid that possible stall near the ground. If we're only 200 feet, look what we lost. Yeah, we're in the ground already. That's right. So what we need to do is understand how to train resilience within the pilot's training, train that resilience into the pilot about how to recover from the startle and surprise. It's a clear stall spin accident. It uh, appears as though the aeroplane's been lifted off the ground, probably unnecessarily early, considering the space that's left. No, high nose attitude and then a stall, followed by a wing drop. I remember getting in the airplane warming the airplane up and how hot the day was. Um, after that, I don't really remember much at all. The plane was 80 horsepower and a little heavier than the planes I was used to flying, so power to weight ratio was probably a little less than I was used to from the planes I'd taken off there before. As I can see on the video, I scrubbed the airplane off the ground roughly around 200 feet of runway and was in ground effect. And as I went over the valley, lost my ground effect and my assessment by watching the video, I thought I'm assuming the plane would just maintain its speed or gain speed. And I knew I was flying into a crosswind from my right, but I thought the plane would probably be able to power through it. Um, a lot of things went wrong, including, you know, the crosswind, you know, loss of ground effect, the hot day. The plane went into about a 360 degree stall spin and impacted the ground. I don't recall anything after that, my, uh, my son came down, shut the fuel off, which if I were caught in it and it caught fire, I wouldn't be here today. Um, so that was exceptionally lucky that happened. Um, was in the hospital about two months, intensive care, I was unconscious about six days. Um, 
so wheelchair for six months. It uh, broke multiple bones in my face to my ribs to about everywhere in my body, my back. I have a rod in my leg. Um, at one point they were gonna amputate my right foot, but so it was a traumatic experience to say the last, least. If I'm uh, taking off and I force the airplane to become airborne early, the main thing the ground effect produces is a dramatic uh, reduction in drag, in, uh, in uh, induced drag. Uh, and so the aeroplane be, behaves as though it, it was going to accelerate like mad. It feels really good while it's in roughly one to one and a half wingspans is usually put down as a figure of height. The problem then being that if the aeroplane if the promises that it's going to fly like mad, like a homesick angel as they say, you know, and they say the pilot encourages it to go, it gets beyond about one and a half wingspans of height and then it seems like someone tied a parachute on the back. And all of a sudden, although you haven't done anything, all of a sudden the airspeed's dropping for no apparent reason. And because you're leaving, you, you are getting benefit of ground effect. You shouldn't be flying in that condition. Um, so the danger there is, of course, that if the aeroplane loses sufficient speed, it speeds where lift comes from, the aeroplane settles back, in the worst case, back onto the runway, but now you've just used another 200 metres. Takeoff emergencies are a key area where we see loss of control events. Maintaining control energy in the aircraft is paramount, along with the correct actions and decisions. In the following example, we see how the pilot responds to the change of energy. Nice, good work getting your nose down. But how easy is it for a pilot to become confused in an emergency situation? Engine failure, where are you going to go? Oh, the one down below you. I'm going to land on my left. Oh, you won't. Oh, this one. Yep. Oh, because of the thing. Yeah, there's a cow there. All right. Let's get all the flap out. As we're committed. All right, 45 knots. Nose down, nose down, nose down. That's it. Trim it out, trim it out. OK, start turning. Lose height in a turn. Now, because of the nature of this, if you need to use a little bit of power, that's fine. Okay, wings level. Okay, go straight in. And the pilot of any experience level, faced with a sudden uh, loss of control or potential loss of control situation, is uh, immediate, the immediate reaction is to be startled. Uh, and we, at a time when you can't afford to have hesitation and you have to have an ingrained reaction to it really. And uh, uh, when I was uh, <coughs> training students on a regular basis, um, we, uh, we used to make a habit of uh, uh, in flight, this is not so much takeoff, but in flight, or even on, on the ground, because often, often the student will oblige by providing you with an example of loss of control. So you can do something about it then. But in flight, we used to simply uh, give students regular practice at recovering. There's a very old sort of uh, catchphrase that was used for years of PAT, power attitude trim. So if you want to establish any given performance uh, condition, then you apply the power that's appropriate, you adopt the attitude that's appropriate, and when you're satisfied things are working, you trim, power attitude trim. Loss of control can be uh, addressed the same way. The pre-flight is essential, and if you're operating from rough or unprepared strips, more so than any other time. In fact, you should be doing a post-flight check. I have landed on rough airfields and noticed some damage towards the back of the tail because of uh, debris being thrown up. So check the aircraft after each flight. Really thoroughly check it before each flight. Your pre-flight check is one of the most important things you could ever do. The fact that we survived it uninjured is a plus and that the lesson and the learnings come from it. And if we're able to share that learning with other pilots, then I see that as a huge benefit. 
it absolutely comes down to knowledge of yourself and knowledge of your own aircraft, what your aircraft is going to do. Okay, If you're not sure, there's a lot of very qualified instructors around Australia who can show you in a safe, controlled manner. If I could go back, I would, of course, make the decision not to take the plane off there that day, haul it down to my runway on a trailer that you know has more runway. Um, I got complacent. I uh, flew, like I said, a lot of unimproved runways and thought I could, you know, take the plane off there and, you know, I could handle about anything. If you have to think more than once, twice about whether it's safe or not to do the flight, my suggestion is to do something different, either find a different day, different runway, or don't do it at all. My hope is um, talking about this accident and that it will help one person to make a better decision than I did or better decision than some of the pilots that have had this happen to them and weren't as fortunate as me so that they don't end up where I'm at because I end up every day, every minute of every day, um, dealing with the pain of walking, um, my face being numb, to um, the injuries I'm sustained will be with me the rest of my life. And it's not something I wish on anyone. We need to thank all the pilots who were brave enough to put their stories out there, and our experts and our instructors for the information they've shared with us today. We can see in the takeoff phase of flight how easily a loss of control event can occur and how important it is to understand things like weight, balance, performance, configuration and the conditions before every takeoff. We have to overcome the temptation to try and force the aircraft into the air before it's ready and also if we encounter an emergency situation, overcome the human factor to not recognise, to, to freeze or not react correctly with the right control actions. Um, to avoid a loss of control, particularly after an engine failure and to take off. Any one of these factors can cause us to have a loss of control in takeoff phase of flight. So it's important that we recognise the onset and avoid them before they develop into a loss of control. Make sure you understand the forces that are going to affect you during the takeoff phase of flight, know how to manage them, and more importantly, know how to recognise when they're not going the way you want to go. And remember, takeoffs are optional. Join us for episode two, where we look at loss of control in flight. Loss of control, we've been focused outside. We've and allowed airspeed to increase. We're not stalled. Arguably the most critical area where we see severe or fatal accidents.